Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, which means peace be unto you. Welcome to another episode of The Dean Show. We're here trying to help you understand Islam, which is the fastest going way of life in the world today, and Muslims. And I have two special guests. I'm very excited to introduce my good friend, Frank Avila. Thank you for having me on again, Eddie. Thank you for being with us. And Noman Ali Khan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullah. What I just said was, he wished me peace, I wished him peace back, and you're watching the Dean Show. So, Frank Avila, attorney, somewhat involved in politics, might run for president one day? I doubt that, but who knows? Who knows? And uh, Noman Ali Khan, in charge of the professor of the Arabic at the Baina Institute. Yes. All right. You know, we're about here on the Dean Show trying to help people understand the most important fundamental. Uh, thing in life, trying to have people acknowledge the existence of God and our duties towards Him, and trying to help convey the simple message that Islam calls the people to worship the one God, the God that created you, the God that took care of you while you were in your mother's womb, and He's taking care of you today. He wants you to worship Him alone, not to worship or set up another God besides Him. So we have, throughout time, He has sent messengers to relay the message on how he wants us to live, and he's made a barter with the human being. If you obey God on his terms, he's guaranteed you paradise. It's very simple. Now, the last and final messenger came to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and over 23 years, what was compiled was the Quran. So we want to talk to Frank and we want to talk to Noman Khan about the Quran. Frank Avila, he's a devout Christian, Catholic. I'm probably a bad Catholic, bad Christian, Catholic, but I try to, uh, I do, I am Catholic Christian. Yes. So how would we, as ones who submit and surrender to one God, as mm -hmm. Muslims, how would we go about, in a practical way, not trying to end up like we're proselytizing or, you know, being pushy, how can we uh, talk to Frank, someone like Frank, and show them that this is indeed not the words of Muhammad, but this is revealed from the creator of the heavens and earth, not to just the Arabs, but the whole of mankind, and prove to him, give him the evidence that this is from God. In the end, Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah, I think the, the first acknowledgement is guidance is in the hands of Allah. Yeah. Uh, human beings can make their best efforts to present evidence. Uh, but in the end, Allah is the one who turns the hearts. Um, we have examples of people like Abu Bakr, who when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam introduced himself as a messenger, there was no time lag, there was no discussion, he immediately accepted Islam. And on the other hand, you have Musa or Moses uh -huh. debating with Pharaoh, uh, and this dialogue is going back and forth over and over, and he sees miracles in front of his eyes, yet he's still not willing to believe. So the first acknowledgement, of course, is that evidence alone doesn't lead somebody to guidance. It is, in the end, their sincerity and then divine intervention. It is Allah who uh, guides. And we ask all of us to be guided. It's not something that we own or anybody else owns. It's the ownership of God. It's the ownership of Allah. And we, beg all, we all beg Allah for guidance. So much so that the Muslim is required in his prayers to ask Allah for guidance. And you don't ask for something you don't, you don't already have. So if I already had guidance, I wouldn't be asking for Ihdina Sirat al-Mustaqeem, guide us to and along the straight path. So this is something we are in need of as much as anybody else. This is the first thing. The second thing, I think the concept of miracles. Um, as understood in Islam, as, as an introductory point before we even talk about the Quran is very important. Uh, I mean, put yourself in these shoes. Maybe you live a few thousand years ago, and your neighbor, who's a nice guy, everybody knows him in the neighborhood, um, respected gentleman, good businessman, comes from a good family, he knocks on your door one day and he tells you that he's a messenger of God because an angel came to him the other night and revealed this message to him. And not only did he reveal his message to him, now he has to deliver it to, to the neighbor, to the family, to everybody in the society. And on top of this, not only do you have to believe what he's saying, you have to follow every one of his instructions because they're actually not his instructions, they're God's instructions. And not following them will mean you will live a cursed life here and eternal doom in the hereafter. Now this is what your neighbor comes and tells you. What's your immediate response? I mean, the immediate response for any normal human being is either A, you're crazy, B, what did you have for dinner last night? Yeah. You know, uh, maybe he's, he's possessed. Nowadays we say he's psychologically disturbed. In the old days they said he's possessed. Yeah. Right? Or he's playing a trick. He's, he can't be for real. So skepticism is the normal response to a tall claim like that. And this is all of the prophets. All of the prophets claim to be messengers of God that received revelation, that speak on behalf of the Lord of the worlds. 
So from the very beginning, what we have to understand, nowadays it's easy to accept a religion because you have millions of followers, right, all over the world, believing the same thing. But imagine you have to be the first one. And everybody around you, your entire society says, this man is crazy, don't listen to him. Which is the same of Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, and of Moses as it is of Muhammad So this is the first thing. Messengers put themselves in a very difficult position. Not by their own choice because God gives them their responsibility. And we also know it, it is our creed as Muslims that messengers, prophets and messengers, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, uh, Noah, etc., etc. These are the most intelligent people that ever lived on the face of the earth. That God picked the most noble and smart people to do His task. And these people, as smart as they are, they would have pretty well known that if I make this claim to be a messenger, that the response I'm going to get is in the negative, for the most part. Yet, and they, it's not like they're making this casual conversation on a train ride. They're doing this with their family, with their neighbors, with their business partners, with their society, with the leaders of their communities, every single day for decades, sometimes centuries in the case of Nuh, Nuh alayhi salam, right? It is almost, it seems an impossible task. And in this impossible position, it is understandable that very, very few people believed. And whoever did believe was considered crazy. These are the fanatics. And at the end of the day, when it became so difficult for the messengers to deliver their message, one of the precedences, one of the great legacies of God, of Allah, is that He would support His messengers with a miracle. In some cases, the miracle would come early. In other cases, it would come late. But it would come. It would come to support their message, to make them more believable. If you don't think this is from me, here's a sign. So for example, for Muslims, Jesus السلام, speaks at the day of his birth. And he claims the innocence of his mother when he's a day old. This in itself is a miracle, proving the truth that he in fact is a messenger. We learn in the Qur'an, وَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَالتَّورَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ The angel tells Mary in the Qur'an that he is going to teach Jesus as a child, he will have knowledge of the Torah and the Injil, the Gospel, all together. So he won't have to go study it to have the knowledge of it, he'll be given the knowledge of it to begin with. Which is why he's going to be able to correct the rabbis who may have made uh, alterations at that time to the Bible, and he'll be coming after them, you've changed the Word of God, etc. Mm -hmm. So, uh, prophets were given remarkable miracles. Now if you study the history that is common to Muslims and Christians and Jews, you find miracles like a staff turning into a snake, or a water parting in the case of Moses, or a dead person coming back to life, or the blind being able to see, or a, a clay bird being blown into and it turns into a real bird. These are miracles of prophets that we all believe in. The thing of it is though, Muslims believe that the overwhelming miracle of Islam, of Muhammad وسلم, is not something visual. It's this message, it's these, it's these words. And they're not even given in the form of a book or a tablet or anything, they're, they're spoken word. The Qur'an in its original form is spoken word. This is a dramatic departure from all the miracles of the past. I mean, if you talk to someone of, of, of uh, similar faith, the Christian Jewish tradition, if you think of miracles, they're th something for the eyes to see for the most part, right? A blind person being able to see yeah. again, and you know, uh, um, a leper being cured, etc. But for now, this miracle is, not, is less for the eyes to see, but for more for the ears to hear. So how can that be miraculous? This is the first question that comes to mind. The, the Muslim response to that is, number one, the reason for this miracle being an audible one is because it had to outlive the life of its messenger. We Muslims believe Muhammad is the final messenger, mm -hmm. sallam, and this message has to be carried forward. Now for a believing follower of Jesus, when he tells his child, I saw the dead person come back to life, I saw the blind being cured with my own eyes, that's a father narrating an eyewitness account that child would narrate it to his next generation as a family tradition. But after a few generations, it's just a story. You could believe it or you could say, I've heard this from my parents, I don't know, I didn't see it for myself. Which is the skeptic attitude we have today. The final messenger was given a miracle that you can look into much after he's gone. Unlike the miracles of previous prophets. Just as a small example again, we believe that uh, Noah, for example, Noah alayhi salam, um, or actually let's take Salih, Salih is an Arab messenger. He was given a she camel as a miracle that came out of a boulder. It wasn't born of, born of a, another camel, it was born out of a boulder. Yeah. Now I could tell you that, but you don't have to believe me because you didn't see it happen, right? You, a skeptic could say, well, that sounds nice, but it's just another fairy tale. This is mythology, Islamic mythology. 
So we were given something in, in Islamic creed, in the intellectual tradition, one consistent subject for the last 14, 1500 years in Islamic scholarship has been the subject called Ijazul Quran. What that literally means is the overpowering, miraculous power of the Quran. That's what that subject is. So uh, as an introduction, what I wanted to share is we're not talking about the Quran's spiritual power or you know, like you could say, uh, a believer could say, well, I believe the Old Testament is a miracle in my heart. Or a Hindu could say the Vedas have spiritual miracles performed in, on me. Yeah. We, don't, we don't mean it in that spiritual sense. We actually mean it much more in an intellectual sense, in an academic sense. So inshallah, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Tell us, I want to get Frank involved here. Tell us, Frank, in this book that was compiled over 23 years, it clearly defines who God is, that he's the creator of all, the sun, the moon, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad. He's the creator of man, but he's not a man. He doesn't eat, sleep. He doesn't do any of these things that men, women do, that he's distinct from his creation. He created the creation. It clearly defines who God is and who he isn't. It talks about the purpose of the human's life. Clearly defines it. It talks about the hereafter, paradise, hellfire. It has certain things that of the human development of the embryo and the mountains and things in creation that modern scientists today have testified that there's no way that this can come from man. Mohammed could not have known these facts about human development in the 7th century because most of them were not discovered until the 20th century. That God transmitted through Mohammed bits of his knowledge that we have only discovered for ourselves in recent times. 1,400 years ago, when the world was immersed in darkness, the Quran was revealed, which brought light to a beleaguered world. And whereas the earlier books came with many scientific mistakes due to the hand of man having delved into them, the Quran had none of these contradictions. The world thought there could be no reconciliation between religion and science. But the Quran mentioned many scientific facts in great detail, like how a human being developed in the mother's womb and described other scientific facts which amaze the world's renowned scientists and scientific community. Modern scientists today have testified that there's no way that this can come from man. So I want to get your response to some of this. You got to hang out with some Muslims and you got to learn a little bit about Islam. So tell us, what do you feel? Where do you feel this book came from? It had to come from somebody, somewhere. Well, uh, there's, some, there's a couple concerns I have vis-a-vis -vis the Quran. Yes. The first thing is, is that different from the Bible, the Bible was compiled over time by different people. So you don't have one author. So in the terms of the Quran, you have one author, mm -hmm. and that's uh, Muhammad, who you consider the prophet, and not only the prophet, but the seal of the prophets and the greatest of all prophets. Yeah. Although I know that some Muslim sects believe that there have been prophets after Muhammad. Mm -hmm. um, but in most, I think, mainstream uh, Muslims believe he would be the seal of the prophet and the, certainly the most important prophet. Um, so the second thing is the interpretation. Some Muslims seem to believe, in my reading, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the Quran is not merely, um, as you said, uh, contextualized, that it is the literal word of God given, almost transliterated uh, from the mind of God to the prophet Muhammad. And that in the case of the Bible, people are writing, and some is mythology, some are parables and stories, some are literal history, some are metaphors. Um, that it is through the context of history. So God did not dictate by some auto-suggestion in terms of at least the Catholic way we read the Bible. It was interpreted. Um, and that is through the lens of the human being. So the human being is inspired, but he writes through the context of his history. Mm -hmm. In the terms of the Quran, it seems much more dramatic that it is indeed the literal, literal word, word. Out of God. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. So bi the Bible is the word of God but not necessarily the literal word of God. Mm -hmm. It is the word of men inspired by God writing through the lens of their own language, their own uh, history, their own context, their own literary styles, etc. So the question to me is, is that you make the claim that God um, uh, inspired the prophet Muhammad to write the Quran. However, how do we know that it was God? Even the Prophet Muhammad himself, and correct me if I'm wrong, at first didn't know if it was God. And there's an Islamic concept or a concept even in pre-Islamic society, and you would use a different term, but even in Christian or other societies of the unseen world, the jinn. 
you know, kind of made into comedy. And I Dream of Genie. You have a genie. Mm -hmm. uh, I always thought it was a funny show with Barbara Eden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very funny show. But that is actually the concept of the jinn. However, the jinn in most concepts is a negative type of entity, not necessarily a demon, but a negative type of entity. So, um, uh, Muhammad says it's the angel, angel Jabril, the angel Gabriel, the same angel that came to the Virgin Mary. So, how do we know that? the angel is not a demon, is not a jinn. Uh, the same thing, uh, the founder of Mormonism, Joseph yeah. Smith, he claims the, the angel Morani came to him and gave him a new revelation of Jesus Christ in the Book of Mormon. So he's making a very similar claim to Islam in the sense that now we have a new revelation, not just somebody who studied, but actually God coming to somebody. So sure. I want Noman to answer this. So you're saying the question is, that, how do parts, we know? Yeah. Three parts, no answer. But tell me this. So how do we know that it's God who inspires the Prophet Muhammad? Sure. And then the other problem I have with it, it's not just like the Bible of many different authors inspired by God. It is actually the literal word of God, uh, which makes it much different than so, the so Bible before, and much more problematic in my Before mind. he goes okay. into answering, tell me just one thing, just hypothetically. If you with full conviction believe that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a messenger, and there was enough evidence, because I believe you're a sincere individual, would you accept this as a way of life from God? Well, here, if, uh, if, obviously, if it was, if, but, but see, it, that, this is like the question that we've talked about on another show, yeah. is if God created a rock so heavy that he could pick it up. Obviously, if I believe that it was the truth, then it's the truth. But if I don't believe it's the truth, so the two other so if, things, if, if, as, as, as the, 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 the two things that the Quran says aren't possible that I as a Christian believe is, uh, one is a metaphysical impossibility, I believe, that you'd believe, so did the Jews, is the idea of the incarnation. Can God become man? Yeah. And so okay. the Quran says that, that indeed Jesus is not God, that he is a prophet, an mm -hmm. honored prophet, but a man. And then the second issue, which I find more contradictory in terms of history, is the idea of the resurrection. Yeah. So if a, a Muslim says, well, the resurrection didn't happen because the Quran said it so, it becomes cyclical argument. So the reason that I don't have that conviction, obviously, if I believe that the Quran was truth, then I would believe it's so the let's truth. So let's say, okay. just, okay, one plus one is 15. Let's say you were taught this from a young age, but let's say now he convinced you that, no, one plus one is two. Would you accept it or continue a tradition that you were uh, used to for years? That's well, something. Let me interject here. Okay. okay. There are multiple issues that he's yeah. raised, so we have to try to address each one. I, mean, I don't know if we'll get a chance to address yeah, all okay. of them, but at least we have to attempt. Yeah. Uh, the first thing as a correction, Muhammad, Muhammad didn't write the Qur'an because mm -hmm. he didn't know how to write. Yeah. And it wasn't compiled in written form until after. And it, it was compiled to some extent in his lifetime on parchment, leather, rock, bones of animals. But the primary archiving of the Qur'an was memorization. Okay, so this is the first thing. The second thing, um, actually what you present as your fundamental intellectual problem, Qur'an having single source, right, or the inspiration coming to one, and then on top of that, it being literal, not uh, inspired. Instead of being the inspired word of God, it's the literal word of God. These are actually the things that brought me to my conviction. <laughs> so we're well, looking they, at they, the, they could be the conviction, but then where where does the original, the where does the original source saying, okay, this is the okay. source? Now, now here's the thing. Uh, two part answer. The first part is if we experience, if we see something miraculous um, at the hands of Moses and we explain it away as the work of demons. It is possible, but actually by saying that, by saying that that was the work of demons, what we're actually kind of acknowledging is that it was superhuman. That's not possible by a human being, okay? Now the question remains, are th there, there are two parts. One, to prove the miracle itself. What makes it miraculous? The fact that it's the literal word of God we have to show that it's somehow this language is superior to any human document beyond the shadow of a doubt to be able to say this is this can't be human work. So let me ask this that question. Why is the Quran then in your mind more superior than the Vedas or the Bhagavad okay. Gita or the Here's Bible the or the Gospel or okay. any other religious document? All right. So like I said in, in my first introduction, I'm, I'm trying to elaborate that point now. I didn't get into that yet. Islamic scholarship is concerned itself with the subject titled The Overpowering Miracle of the Qur'an for a Millennium and a Half. It has been studied from many, 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 many angles. In more recent history, you alluded to it, there's a discussion of scientific phenomena in the Qur'an that could not have been known at the time and are only now coming to rehash and, uh, uh, and surface. For example, the moon not having light of its own or 
two different kinds of water in the oceans, you know, heavy water and light water, etc. These kinds of things that are alluded to in the Quran that are now only being discovered in science. But this is a recent discussion. This predates, this. you could argue, maybe the last 50, 70 years. But we're, Islam, Muslims are holding on to their creed that the Quran is miraculous for a millennium and a half. That's a long time without any scientific issues, right? The issue is this. In speech, we argue that, that speech is basically comprised, it, it comprises two components, style and content. And great speech is that which has meaningful content, but it's presented in marvelous style, right? What we're arguing in, in the, the linguistic study of Quran, and this is what's not easily translated into another language, is because it's the literal word of God, the way, not just what he says, but how he says it makes it miraculous. Now that's very difficult to explain to somebody who doesn't study Arabic, and this makes my job particularly difficult, because I'm trying to say the Qur'an is miraculous in a linguistic sense, right? And so obviously the language that Muslims believe is Arabic, so much so that right now this rendition of the Qur'an, it's cover to cover English, it's a translation of the Qur'an. The title says Qur'an, no Muslim will ever call this Qur'an. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't call this a Quran. You would say this is a, an attempt at the meanings of the Quran. Yes. At the most, right? This is across cultures. Okay. Well, let me let me ask you a question on that. So, there is a concept in Islam. It seems that the Quran must or should be in Arabic. Yes. And that because and, it's a literal word. A, uh, yeah, it's a literal word of God. But it seems to me that, and that's not believed by Christians or some Jews believe that about Hebrew, although it, it, it depends. Um, but it seems that, and in terms of if Islam is a universal message, that the language is accidental or incidental. Very so if Christians do not believe that Latin or Greek or even Hebrew are inherently sacred mm -hmm. languages. Mm -hmm. They're merely languages that are sacred because of the purposes Very of good. using them. Very so good. you could have the vernacular language. You could have English. You could have, historically it's Latin, historically it's Greek, historically it's Hebrew, but it's not inherently Hebrew. Okay. But it seems that Hindus do believe inherently Sanskrit is more holy. Yes. Uh, Arabs believe inherently Arabic, like is, Arabic is, is, is more holy. Sure. And then some Jews believe inherently Hebrew is more holy. But if you have a universal message, to me... Um, Excellent point. Now here's the thing. Yeah. You, got, you've, you have two parts. The Quran is a message to the Muslims, a message for humanity, and it's a miracle. The message has to be translated in every language. And it actually started happening even in the life of the Prophet himself. The first attempts at a Hebrew translation of the Bible happened by Ibn Abbas, عنهما, a companion of the Prophet, who learned Hebrew just to get, communicate the message to the Jewish community. But the miracle of the Quran is something limited to the Arabic in terms of the language. There are other aspects of the miracle, like the scientific phenomena and that stuff, that can be translated. But just to give you a taste of what I'm talking about, when I first got into this subject, and I, as I was being raised as a Muslim, I was kind of a skeptic myself. And I heard over and over again that the Qur'an is an incredible language, unsurpassed language. It's the, it's the marvel of, of literature. And my first, I, didn't, I wasn't a student of Arabic at all. And in high school in this country, I just became curious. I started reading the Qur'an for myself. And I found, actually, that it was confusing literature. It was moving from subject to subject. Tenses were changing. Context was changing. Uh, surahs were changing in, the, in their historical context. There was a lot of shift, and I didn't understand because coming from a Western point of view, you have a certain view of how you critique literature, right? Now, when I got into Arabic studies, and I uh, I, I started diving into this question of what makes the Quran miraculous, I started discovering things that literally they overpowered me, and I'm still a student of them. I actually teach a seminar that's traveling the country called Divine Speech. And the entire intent of the seminar is to expose the literary marvel of the Qur'an to an English-speaking audience without resorting to Arabic. That's, my, that's the seminar. Now, just one example. The Qur'an, Muslims believe, is a spoken word. It's not written. We also believe that Muhammad وسلم, didn't, know, didn't have the ability to write. We also know that when he would recite the Qur'an, there would be dozens of followers, and they would immediately memorize what he said, and it would just spread. So there's no editorial process. You can't go back on what you recited. It's gone. It's out there now. You can't take it back. It's kind of like sending an email nowadays, right? Now, one, just as an example, one phrase in the Quran that's part of a large discussion is the phrase "Warabbaka fakabir." In Arabic, it says "Warabbaka fakabir," which means, "And declare the greatness only of your Lord." Now, recall I said something about a fusion of style and content. This, the content is beautiful, and it's part of a passage in which 
the, the signs of the Lord have been mentioned, the struggle has been mentioned, and then the messenger is being told, declare the greatness only of your Lord. What's interesting is the phrase, رَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ is a palindrome. In other words, it spells backwards and forwards the same way. So the Qur'an is declaring the greatness of the Lord in a way, in its spelling form, and this is multiple instances in the spoken Qur'an, that it, it's actually a linguistic palindrome. Now, when you want to generate a palindrome in English, like a uh, race car, or Bob, or Dad, or something like that, small one-syllable ones are easy to generate. Maybe a big word is a little harder, but a sentence? It would take you some time to sit down with words that are spelled backwards and forwards and come up with something that... And then even if you do that, your concern isn't your content. What's your concern? The spelling. So the spelling is actually dictating your content. Here you have multiple instances in the Qur'an where this, the content hasn't been altered. The content is continued, it flows with the passage, and yet the spelling structure is... You know, it, it's a palindrome. It's symmetrical, backwards and forwards the same way. And this is not one. These are multiple instances in the Qur'an. And this is one area of the many areas of the linguistic marvel of the Qur'an. The only other thing I want to comment that's easily understandable, uh, actually two things. One, from a historical point of view. Uh, in the 1600s, I, th I believe this was a professor of the Catholic Church, had written a paper about the, uh, the great error in the Qur'an, the great historical error in the Qur'an. And that refers to, you know, the Pharaoh and Moses? Well, Pharaoh in the Qur'an tells one of his ministers, whose name is Haman, okay, he tells him to build him a tower so he may reach the God of Moses and, you know, to discuss with him. Now, this occurs about four or five times in the Qur'an. Haman is mentioned a total of six times in the Qur'an. When Christian and Jewish scholarship came into contact with this passage, the criticism was, first of all, there's no Haman mentioned in the Bible in association with the Pharaoh. Second of all, he, is, he has been mentioned in the book of Esther's under the king Xerxes in the story of the Tower of Babylon, the Tower of Babylon, the famous story. And this is a thousand years after Moses. So it's a completely different historical era where Haman, and that man, that man Haman has been mentioned as building a tower. So the obvious uh, uh, alleged error was that Muhammad, Ma'adullah, may have confused these stories that he was kind of getting from the Christians and Jews and kind of mixed them together and presented this. And this has been something that's been reiterated in uh, Jewish well, Studies Encyclopedia. And all right, well, let me break in on here. And I am not an expert in this, so it's hard for me to comment on the specific, but that there is an uh, allegation that um, the Quran is bits and pieces of different Gnostic and different other... Uh, religious literature that was out there at the time. Yeah, there's no evidence to it. And, and the, the coherence of the Qur'an, the cohesion of it as a text, is, is the ultimate proof to the contrary. But uh, just on that historicity point, uh, Maurice Bokwa, in like, uh, it's about 70 years ago that he engaged in this study. He said, well, Jewish history contradicts what the Qur'an is saying about Haman and this tower building. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Egyptology. Let's look at Egyptian history, mm -hmm. because the French and the Germans at the early part, the late part of the 1800s, had already started translating or, or getting into Egyptian hieroglyphics and re reformulating the language to try to translate some of the ancient Egyptian texts. Egyptology was a big deal in the early 1900s, even. So he travels uh, to speak to some of these Egyptologists. Says to them, the Quran has this name, Haman, as a minister working for the historical pharaoh at the time of Moses, that specific pharaoh. Egyptologists tell him, and this is actually articulated in his book, The Bible, Quran, and Science, um, that there's no way this man could have known that name, and we probably it's not even going to be there because that language, e the Egyptian hieroglyphic language, was already dead for a couple of thousand years. Nobody knew that language. Mm -hmm. After translation, he goes to Austria and finds out there's actually a list of people that worked in the, um, the, the, the court of, uh, of Pharaoh. They find Haman as the chief architect that's actually found in Egyptology, a name mentioned in the Qur'an. So from the historical point of view, uh, last comment uh, on this issue of the, the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, the Qur'an claims, inna nahnu nazalna dhikr. We are the ones who have revealed the ultimate reminder. We meaning? God himself. He speaks of himself in the royal. Okay. And uh, he says we've made the Qur'an easy for remembrance. We've made the Qur'an easy for remembrance. This is a statement occurred multiple times in the Qur'an. To this day, the only book that, to my knowledge, that is memorized by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people of all ages, despite their language background, 
in by the letter from one end of the book to the other is the Quran without photographic memory. I don't have photographic memory. I just started learning Arabic in 2000. I've already memorized half the Quran. And this is part-time endeavor. Um, you know, in, in Chicago land, probably you'd find a couple of hundred kids yeah. that have easily memorized the entire Quran. In China, you'll find kids that have memorized, adults that have memorized Quran. So the fact that the Quran says that it's miraculously easy to memorize, a 600 page document, miraculously easy to memorize, and it's memorized by people from all over the world by, to the letter, in and of itself is a miracle. We're going to have to get together again. They're signaling that we are out of time. Frank, thank Definitely you. Definitely need more time on these topics. Y yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for being with us, Frank. Thank you, uh, Brother Norman Khan. And I'd like to thank you for sitting tight to another episode of The Dean Show. As you can see, we can sit with our brothers in humanity and s discuss some of these topics in a civil way, and we can agree to disagree. Or one day, that brother that you're sitting with might acknowledge that there's only one God and he agrees to worship the Creator alone without any associates and Inshallah. that Muhammad is the last and Salam final Salam. messenger. So with that said, we hope to see you again next time on The Dean Show. Until then, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. Wa alaikum